Episode 195. Exchange salt for... A bowl of impurities could be filtered out from a bucket of salt, with there being sand and floating algae. There were even dead bugs and small fish. The earlier displeased tiger beast men didn't dare to utter a single word. All the salt was mixed with water and filtered. Even the half bucket of salt that had been extracted through boiling was no exception. After it was done, the sky had turned dark and the beast men left. The leopard cubs had run wild for a day. They returned with their own hunt. Howl! The three cubs placed their hunt by their mother's feet and grabbed onto her lower thigh. Even though their claws were drawn back, Blair's skin still hurt from their scratches. She could vaguely smell a farting stench and lowered her head to see a blue-tailed fox covered in blood next to her foot. That blue color was too bright, and Blair instantly felt that something was amiss. This could be said to be one's instincts. All bright things in the natural world emitted a hint of strangeness. They would either be extremely toxic, stinky, or have some other reasons for driving people crazy. This was their protective coloration that reminded those who hunted them. Oh, ha, <laughs> ha, Stephanie burst out laughing while backing up. Blair, your cub caught a blue-tailed fox. What's wrong with a blue-tailed fox? Blair asked, feeling baffled. Back then, Miles also gifted her with bright blue clothing, but she hadn't worn it before. Later on, she also left it behind in the Peacock Village. Roger scolded. Little rascal. He then shoved third away, the one who had caught the blue-tailed fox. You'll sleep on the top floor today. How? Third looked toward his mother, feeling aggrieved. He suddenly sneezed. Roger explained. When the blue-tailed fox is frightened, it'll fart. Third is going to stink for a month. Blair, don't get too close, else the smell might get to you. <laughs> Blair burst out laughing. She recalled that Miles also stank for a while. It was because he had hunted a blue-tailed fox. Ah. It had been very long since she had seen him. She wondered how he was doing, and if he had returned to the peacock village. Third had initially been very proud of hunting the most beautiful prey. After hearing his father's words, he was completely stunned. Blair saw how pitiful he looked and felt like laughing even more. She held back her laughter and walked over to him. Baby, don't be sad. One month will pass by very quickly. Mommy won't despise you. Unlike your blockhead of a dad. How? Third looked at her with water gleaming in his eyes. They were half a year old, and the color of their pupils wasn't as deep anymore. However, they were still clear. Blair could understand the feelings when looked at by those emotional eyes, even though they couldn't communicate with each other. Blair lowered her head and rubbed the tip of her nose against Third's black nose. She was about to breathe when her nose moved to the top of his head. A strong, concentrated scent of bedbugs amidst lanugo gushed into her nose like they were alive. That feeling was as if she had forcibly chugged down a bucket of putrid sewage water. Blair blanked out and she forgot where she was. Who am I? What am I doing? Where is this place? Blair only regained her senses after she raised her head seemingly calmly and left the source of the pollution. She coughed and did a hand gesture to third, indicating that I'm refusing the invitation. You better sleep on the top floor. Sorry, baby. Oh! Third raised his paw and scratched his head that his mother had smelled. First, who had caught a bird, and second, who had caught a rabbit, were exalted. They imitated their father and stepped on their prey, looking toward third and let out challenging cries in unison. Growl! Third squeezed out a low bellow from his throat. He kicked at the soil with his hind legs and then shot toward them like an arrow that had been released from a bow. 
The three leopard cubs were entangled in a mess as they thought. Roger lifted the stiff corpse of the blue-tailed fox and said, The stench of a blue-tailed fox can stay on another animal for a long time, but it does nothing for the fur. Thankfully, Third didn't destroy the prairie with his bite, and the blood didn't stain the skin. I'll make clothes for you using this. This animal skin being from the prey captured by her child, Blair naturally liked it a lot. She naturally nodded. While Roger was skinning the animal, Rex went into the forest and plucked some rotten tree leaves. Seeing that it was getting late, he caught one prey on the way. After the adults finished tanning the animal skin and preparing dinner, the three leopard cubs turned into mobile nuclear weapons. Before their chubby little bodies came running over, the three adults turned their heads in unison. Roar! Time to eat meat. The leopard cubs roared in excitement. Roger tossed the prey they caught over to them and howled. The three of you are not to go to the second story. All of you, go up to the top story right now. With the assurance of food, there was nothing that could hurt the cubs. Eating the prey they caught respectively, they felt immensely satisfied. After they ate their fill, the skies had darkened by quite a bit. Blair took the chance to take a quick shower before darkness completely descended. Not caring whether the weather was hot or not, she wrapped herself firmly with animal skin. It's my turn today. Having washed his paws and a certain part of his body at the water hole, Roger said this the minute he entered the tree hole. Stephen consciously laid on the third story. Blair merely revealed her head from within. No way, I want to rest. The entire village had heard her moans. Clearly this tree hole had lousy sound insulation. No way. If this were to go on, she might actually wish for her period to come faster. Then again, why wasn't her period here yet? After mating with Stephen, she started counting the number of days by engraving on a wooden block. Counting the engravings on the wooden block, 18 days had passed since... In the blink of an eye, it had been nearly two months since she stopped breastfeeding. It was about time she got her period. Could it be that her body had been adversely affected by giving birth to the cubs? She didn't feel that. Upon hearing this, Roger's face fell. Nonetheless, he asked in concern, Are you tired? Go ahead and rest then. Blair heaved a sigh of relief and loosened the animal skin around her. She sarcastically said, You know I get tired? I thought my wishes don't matter here. I have to be ready whenever you guys want. Why are you like this? Roger said without having time to think, That's because I like you. Whenever we mate, I feel the closest to you. Blair suddenly felt something stir in her heart. Although she had known all along that Roger's feelings towards her were genuine, she still felt very happy to hear such words coming from his mouth. All right, hurry up and sleep. As Blair spoke, she got up and walked to the entrance. Has Rex come up yet? Rex had laid out a new grass nest underneath the tree and was prepared to go to sleep. Upon hearing Blair mention his name, he raised his head at the tree hole. Their gazes accidentally met. Hurry on up, Blair said as she waved a hand at him. Rex cast a glance at Roger, who was standing beside her. Realizing this, Blair also turned her head and looked at Roger. It happened a while ago. Just let him come up, Blair said as she pulled at Roger's hand. Under Rex's nervous gaze, Roger turned around and left the entrance of the tree hole. I have no opinion. Ask Stephen. Blair hurriedly looked up and said, Stephen, I'm letting Rex in, okay? Stephen didn't respond. Blair then crouched at the entrance and waved at Rex. With a smile, she gently called out to him, Hurry up. Rex curled up his grass mattress and carried it before climbing up the tree. Upon seeing Rex go in, the three leopard cubs denied entry by their father stared at each other, then ground their claws and quietly climbed up the tree. Despite their stealth, before they even entered, 
a gentle breeze that blew into the tree exposed their movements. Roger glared at them. To the top floor with you, little devils! How? The leopard cubs curled up and gazed upwards. The top of the tree, appearing sharp and slim, looked unreachable. Now that they started hunting for prey, they knew of the dangers of remaining on the ground. Knowing that they couldn't enter a short tree hole, they resigned to their fates and started climbing towards the top of the tree. Rex climbed up the tree. He didn't choose to occupy the second story. As for the third story that once belonged to him, it was now occupied by Stephen. Hence, he adapted himself to the circumstances and constructed his nest on the fourth story. He slept peacefully that night. The next day, Rex sent someone to transport the filtered salt water to the white ginger field, to pour into the stone pit for it to be exposed to the sun and wind. Apart from the excellent sunshine, there were also no tall trees around, so the wind was stronger. The beast men merely kept vigil and waited for less than two days before they obtained very pure salt. Even the salt cooked from the half-filled buckets looked much prettier now. Back then they had crystallized into blocks, but now they had turned into clear crystals, very much like the texture of sand, easily crushed in one's hands. After a jar of salt was distributed to every member of the tribe, only a layer had vanished from one stone bucket. These five and a half buckets of salt would last the village for several decades. After some pondering, Rex gathered the single males in the village and dropped a bombshell on them. What? You're asking us to use the salt to exchange for females from other villages? The loud voice of the male underneath the tree attracted Blair's attention from up there. She walked to the tree hole entrance and gazed downwards. Rex, who acutely sensed the gaze upon him, instantly turned his head. Seeing that it was Blair, his ferocious expression instantly turned gentle. Turning back, he said to the young beast men, With more females in our village, there will be higher chances of you guys getting a spouse. But what are we to do? Will the other villages consent to the exchange? With nary a change in his expression, Rex said calmly yet vigorously, We have salt, and we can afford to give them more. We don't have to fear that we won't get any females. The males, although eager to give it a shot, still had their doubts. We have enough females in our village. Once we become more powerful, the females will be willing to take us as their spouses. This came from a strong and rather conceited male. Rex sneered and asked in turn, Then do you have the means to protect your female? Of course. Quite a few beast men voiced the same. Back when the Scorpion tribe invaded, I don't recall many males feeling confident of protecting the women in the village. Rex mercilessly reminded them of how pathetic they were back then. The young beastmen felt ashamed of themselves at the mention of this. Since this was a major affair, the tribal head was naturally present. He very much hoped for new citizens, but he only had procreation in mind and hadn't thought of the more far-reaching implications, such as infrastructure. It was only upon hearing the king's words that he could sense that the king aimed to expand their village. "'What are you planning to do, your majesty?' the tribal had asked, confused. "'Have you heard of the city of Beastmen?' Rex asked in turn. The tribal had replied, "'Yes, your majesty.' I know that it's a very big beastman settlement, and that you came from there. Then, do you know how many females there are in the city of beastmen? Rex revealed the answer without waiting for their guesses. Twenty times what we have here. The beastmen broke into shocked gasps. That was way more than the number of females they had in their village. The great number of females was what attracted powerful beastmen from various lands to join the city. There were more than 10,000 males. 